you so much. Uh, absolute pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Um, I actually want to start, as it will not be hard for you to discern, I'm British. Um, that means a few different things, a passionate dislike of the French. But um, what it also means is I grew up in a country where healthcare didn't destroy you. Um, uh, it's a different model, obviously, uh, than the direct care model, but I am a passionate believer in what you guys are doing. I think healthcare should exist in a way that doesn't bankrupt and destroy people's lives. So I'm really excited to be here with you today. We're going to be talking about the topic of messaging. Every one of you here in some setting, in fact, in many different settings and contexts, has a story you're trying to tell, a story you're trying to tell effectively. That will often be to customers or prospective customers, but obviously messaging happens in all kinds of settings. And it is a real struggle to communicate effectively. The overwhelming majority of people do not communicate very effectively. And it's been getting more difficult. Customers are more distracted. Um, uh, they, they don't give us their full attention. You know, the traditional, hey, sit down, get an hour-long meeting is often a thing of the past. And of course, for many of us now, we have to try and accomplish the uh, solve the messaging challenge in a virtual environment. And so that's extraordinarily difficult. So is messaging a problem? Absolutely, it's a problem. If you don't get it right, you're screwed. But it's also, I would argue, an enormous opportunity. What I want to show you today is not only how to transform messaging, but what you get when you do. And what we can see is one of the perhaps greatest ways of inflecting sales outcomes is to fix your messaging. It's not particularly difficult. They're going to have a very dramatic, a dramatic outcome. So what I'm going to do today is three things. I'm going to talk about what goes wrong with messaging. Why is most messaging failing? I'm going to do a very quick tour through how, as we try and communicate in the virtual environment, um, that will tend to amplify mistakes. And then I'm going to spend more, most of the time on how do you fix it? What does extraordinary messaging look like? Now, by definition, this is going to be a very high-level flyover of a bunch of principles. I'm going to be talking mostly about the what, what goes wrong and what getting it right looks like. We don't get a chance to go deeply into the how. Um, although, how many of you here attended Michael's session yesterday, kind of a deeper training? I hope that was helpful for you. Um, there's a whole bunch of tools that underpin this, and there are a few ways you can access those if you want, but that's not my focus today. As far as rules go, um, as much as possible, if we have a couple of questions as we go, I'd love to take them as we go. My job is to manage the clock. I will be around all day, and we'll certainly be there at cocktails, and we'll answer any other questions until I'm no longer coherent. So it'll be about 30 minutes of cocktail hour. And finally, um, you all have this document. You need this. Grab it, open it, have a pen. This is going to carry the, the burden of, uh, in many ways, the burden of the content today. You're going to find it very useful. You're going to want to keep it useful document for retelling the story. I'm going to talk a lot about this today. So ha have that to hand. So let's jump right in. Let's think about messaging and why most messaging um, goes wrong. And um, in fact, if you look at this chart, it's in the top left of your page. This is just a very simple context setting chart. We talk to a lot of companies that we work with. We work with companies like IBM, Disney, Siemens, LinkedIn, Salesforce, Rockwell, Merck. I mean, really good companies. And um, you ask them a simple question, how good is the thing you do for your customers? on a scale of 1 to 10, and they'll say it's pretty good, 8.1 out of 10. I bet you if I asked any of you, how good is the thing you've built for your customers, you would grade it similarly quite highly. But then you ask a second question, when you finally get in front of the customer, how well do you think you're telling the story? And the number plummets universally to an average of 3.9 out of 10, and that number actually gets even lower, the more complex the solution is. And you guys are selling a fairly complex solution into a population that doesn't understand it. So we have this gap, and it seems to exist almost everywhere uh, in the economy. And, and we all have that moment where we think, damn it, I did not make the most of that sales opportunity. So the question, um, if that's kind of a, a good background context, the question is, what are we doing wrong? And I'm going to move pretty briskly here. How many of you have seen sort of slide decks like this? Yeah. How many of you have built and presented slide decks like this, right? And how'd that work for you, right? People hate this, but this is the default way that we communicate. We build dense, bloated PowerPoint slide decks, and then we inflict them on somebody, and, and guess what? It doesn't actually all seem to work out. Now, I want to make a very clear point up front. The problem is not fundamentally PowerPoint. PowerPoint is just a vehicle. 
in certain cases, it can be a decent vehicle to communicate, although I would never use it. I'm going to use four or five images today only, um, and they're supporting a particular point I want to make. I would never make a PowerPoint presentation. But the fundamental problem isn't PowerPoint. The fundamental problem is how you think architecturally about messaging, how you structure your story, and whether that's a leadership story, a fundraising story, uh, a TED talk, or in the, the context we're going to talk about today, a sales message or a sales story. So what is it that's fundamentally uh, going wrong? Now, I'm going to do most of what I'm going to do today on the flip chart, so I'm hoping the camera is going to capture this and project it. So when you look at most communication that you see kind of um, characterized in those PowerPoint decks, there are three mistakes we almost all make when we communicate. Firstly, TMI. We pack too much in. You know, and, and what's really odd about this phenomenon is um, we have really good motives. None of you get up in the morning and go, I hate that freaking customer. I am just going to punish them. I'm going to hit them with so many slides, they're going to wish they'd never been born. We don't set out to do that, but we do, in fact, do that. Um, you know, our, our, our product and solutions are complex. There's a lot to say. There are many technical details. There are potential questions we may need to answer. There's some different issues and interests in the room across various stakeholders. And these decks get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. But what we fail to realize, which is odd because it's been done to us so often, part of our brain knows it's true, is we create just complete cognitive overload. Who's been in that meeting where someone's presenting 40, 50, 60 slides? What, what, roughly what number slide did you decide, I'm done with this? Three. 12, 8, it doesn't matter, it's sure not 60. Um, this deck was one of, a, this deck was 120 slides. This is a very well-known technology company. You all use their technology. I mean, some of these slides, I mean, we're talking about fonts that like only dogs could hear. And there's 120 of these. I mean, some of these individual slides themselves could be the, the subject of a day. And we do this and we think it's never worked when it's done to us, but we then do it to others, which is, I think it's self-paradoxical. The second problem with almost all messaging is it's confusing. And particularly when we talk about sales messaging, our value is sort of unclear. The customer's like, yeah, I, I kind of, I'm sorry, this is one of those display flip charts, not a writing flip chart, so it will fold up quicker than a French infantry division, so we'll just need to be a little <laughs> cautious about that. Is there anyone French in the room? Oh, good. That's going to help us later. Anyway, um, no, the value is unclear. People sit through the meeting, and, and, and you want them to leave going, oh, my goodness, I have to work with these guys. And, and they don't. They say, yeah, I, I think I understood it. You know. And um, again, I, I just brought this with me as one of hundreds that look exactly the same. I, I sort of get it. You know, That's how the thing works. This is how it was built. But why really do I care? Um, and so we want to have that really powerful, compelling interaction with the customer, and we don't get it. There are several reasons for this. One is too much information. One, and this is deadly, I think, in your space, um, is we default to being very technical very quickly, and we underestimate the, the, how much less technically fluent our audience is. I'm interesting. I'm the CEO of a relatively small company. I'm your target customer, many of you. And this isn't an area I'm very familiar with, and it's astonishingly easy to lose me, even though I have just about an above average IQ, I get lost in the, anything technical. It's very easy to create that in symmetry, uh, asymmetry. And the third one, which is really toxic, we'll talk about this later, um, is most messaging lacks a narrative flow or story. It, a story is essential to the human brain in terms of understanding any piece of content. You read a book, right? Chapter four makes sense because of chapter three. But if you read the same book out of sequence, it wouldn't make any sense at all because one chapter three creates the context for chapter four. But again, if I pick up any of these decks, these just each, each slide is its own topic, but there's really no stitching together of an overall narrative. And then the third problem, and this is not the most toxic, they're all equally toxic, is we are automatically, all of us, just fundamentally sender-oriented. We talk about ourselves. Hey, this is our company. This is how we got started. This is who we are. This is what we do. This is a bit of my background. At its worst, you know, here's some buildings we have. They're very pretty, nice flowers outside. You know, we've won all these awards. And, and we default to talking about ourselves, often in the name of building credibility. It's the worst possible way you could try and build credibility. And the customer's like, good for you. Why do I care? 
If I look at that slide deck from this tech company, it was 120 slides, literally 120 were about the product, the solution, how to implement it, its origin. There was really a no point at which was anchored in anything the customer would care about. Now, there are many mistakes made in messaging, but I would argue these are the three most serious, and they almost always show up in conjunction. I could take any deck from any client that we work with, and I'm going to find all three of these strongly in evidence. So the next question becomes, what does that lead to? It's going to lead you to two really bad immediate outcomes. The first one is you want your sales conversations to be compelling, and they're not. They're not as compelling as you want to be. Can you win? Of course you can win. But do you win as often as you should? Do you win every deal you should be winning based on your fit or the match between your solution and the customer's need? And the answer is no. When you had the best fit and you didn't win, very likely, unless there was a budget issue or some other funky thing in the background, probably you didn't tell, didn't tell the story well enough. We're just not winning as often as we should in that first meeting. But interesting, I'm going to argue as important as that is, that is actually not the biggest problem. The next three minutes are the most important three minutes of the day. If all you get out of this session is this three minutes before food coma and the darkness of presenting in Hogwarts you know, sinks in, um, sets in, although it's so nice to be back at Hogwarts. Um, this is, this, I want this to profoundly change the way you think about communication forever. What happens with most messaging in all contexts, but especially sales messaging, it fails the retellability test. Now, this is on your handout. Uh, it's in the upper right, but let me explain. How does sales work? This is how sales works. This is you, and just for the sake of pure simplicity, you're having a one-on-one -on -one first sales meeting with Jack, right? Is that meeting important? Yeah, of course it is. Is that the most important meeting? No. Why? The decision doesn't get made only by Jack. It gets made by a group of people, and it doesn't get made in that meeting. It gets made later. So sometime... Later, there's another meeting, and this meeting you do not get invited to. This is the meeting where formally or informally, the decision-making body at the customer is going to decide, are we going to go, so Jack is here now, are we going to go with what these guys are recommending? Are we going to go with a competitor who's also talking to us? Or are we just going to carry on doing what we're doing now? Because, yeah, Buka sucks, but it kind of works. There's other things we want to think about. So if you think about this, this is the, the process, the way all communication works, interestingly. Leadership communication, especially donor messaging, fundraising messaging, whatever you want to talk about. But sales messaging, this is absolutely fundamental. And what you realize is it's actually Jack's ability to re-articulate or retell your story that is fundamentally where sales success happens. So is this meeting important? Yes. But it's not the most important meeting. This is the most important meeting. How many of you have had a great first sales conversation and you made the stupid mistake that I still make is you get on the phone to your team like, oh, we got this. And then two weeks later, it's like, yeah, thanks, Tim. Uh, we're not moving forward. Who's had that situation? Damn it. Well, it's just freaking obvious what's happening. Something failed here. Now, if this is true, it has three monumentally profound implications. Number one. If your messaging, if you perceive or sense it's weak here, then you know it is absolutely catastrophic here. It's failing wildly here. How do you know that? Because most people, especially in sales, are quite good, especially good sellers, at wrangling a crappy deck and making it work. How many of you have done that? So I put together a 40-slide deck. Not stupid enough, I hope, to try and present 40 slides. I'm going to present 10, and three of them are not very good slides, so I'll kind of explain the bit of the slide I want and ignore the crappy bit of the slide. So what I do is I sort of stitch the real story together on the fly, correct? Great. What are the odds that Jack can do that if I give this to him? Well, first I give it to him, it's going in the trash, because that's what we all do with these. But even if it didn't go in the trash, what are the odds that Jack can go, which eight slides was it, and what was the sequence? Oh, and by the way, I'm not showing this to anybody because I'm not going to try and defend the other 30 slides that were never even presented to me. So what tends to happen is we fool ourselves that it's gone well. Hey, this was great. Here's a copy of my slides. You send them out electronically. Forget that because you're never going to print them out anyway. And you sort of make this ridiculous assumption that Jack's going to retell the story. He's actually completely incapable of doing. 
So that's the first thing. We need to understand that, that when this isn't working here, just how bad it's going to be going here. The second thing is really interesting. As communicators in all contexts, but especially sales, we fixate on first meeting success. Yeah, it went great. You've got to change that. You've got to start thinking about second meeting success. That's the standard for communication. So now the standard gets an awful lot higher. Is it so crisp, so clean, so interesting, so compelling, so simple, captured in such a great document, I'm going to come back to that, that in fact it is possible for Jack to be able to retell the story. By the way, the mistake we'll often make is we assume Jack only merely needs to be motivated. That's not true. It's not enough to be motivated. It's the story is actually capable of telling that story, which gets to the third and the most important piece, which is on your handout. What is the fundamental purpose of messaging? Is it the purpose of messaging to persuade? Yes, absolutely it is. I want this guy to feel like he, he should do something different. But is that the only purpose? No. It is equally the purpose of a sales message to equip. And the reason that matters is I have literally, I don't know what the number is, hundreds if not thousands of sales leaders. I've asked them, do you build messaging to persuade? Like, yeah, Tim, of course we do. Do you build messaging to equip? And they're like, no. In fact, I've never actually even really thought about that. We'll give you a fun idea. Think about the PE ratio, not price earnings. What's your persuade equip ratio? What is the ability that Jack has? How have you equipped him to actually tell the story in the moment? And if, even if you have a good sales story, I suspect your P is going to be much, much higher than your E. So this is an absolutely critical idea. If you want to succeed in sales, you have to understand the buying group. You have to understand who's on it, and you have to understand what is their decision-making process, consensus, command and control. Is it really all about this woman? Because what she says goes. Or we do some work in Sweden with Ericsson. Everything's 100% consensus. Every voice is, e voice is equal, regardless of seniority. Who is on the buying group? What do they care about? And how do decisions get made? This is getting into the deeper end of the pool. And then you can have a focus on the second meeting and build messaging that is really compelling and that will equip them. So when all of this happens, then you ultimately get too bad sales out. So you lose deals, you should be winning, and the deals you do win take too long. You think a deal like, man, we should have got this done in two or three calls, and it goes on and on and on. Why? Because the virus of the message isn't spreading as well as it should. So that's kind of the fundamental um, problem. It's rooted in an overuse of PowerPoint, although PowerPoint isn't, isn't the problem. I was actually curious whether there was a Star Wars quote that described PowerPoint, and there is. It says, you know, once you start down the path, dark path forever, it will control your destiny. Once you become a PowerPoint addict, unless you intentionally break out of that, you are always going to be sucked into these really bad defaults. So today I'm trying to kind of change that a little bit. So, so we're sort of depressed at the moment. But here's the problem. Before I can show you how to fix it, it actually gets worse. How many of you now have some or all of your conversations in a virtual setting? Most of you. Obviously, there's a, a swing back healthily to uh, live meetings. But let's just talk about this for a minute. When the world went virtual, we all asked the same question. And, and everybody, our phones rang off the hook for that spring period. Um, it was, how the hell do we use the platform? What's the best platform? How do I unmute? How do I share a document? Do I use chat and, and all that stuff? Is that important? Yes, it is important. You know, we still people, see people just making really stupid mistakes, like being backlit. Um, the slide there I'm showing is the little image on the middle left of your page where um, uh, you know, somebody's just backlit and it's a really terrible look. You ever been on a meeting and someone's got the laundry on the bed or something like that? I mean, there's some basic platform issues that you want to get right. Now, in this case, this guy was the customer and I'm the seller. He can do whatever he wants. He can be naked and on fire. That's his call. But it's not a professional look for you. People are still making that mistake. But here's the thing. That's not the real issue. The real issue with virtual is not the platform. That's table stakes. And we should, most of us, figured it out by now, even though we haven't. The really interesting thing about virtual communication is this. Communication, and sales communication in particular, is a uniquely social process. It is a very complex, delicate dance between people. 
You know, the customer has a problem, they want to buy, but they don't like being sold to. It's an astonishingly delicate dance. And what happened in the virtual world is it moved into a fundamentally asocial environment, a socially sterile environment. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but let me just cover it because it's incredibly important what impact it had. You see the graphic on your page. There were three ways in which the social dynamic changes when we move into a virtual environment. And because, as a result of these three changes, they will amplify messaging mistakes. First one is distraction. Customers are highly distracted now. How many of you have been on a Zoom call and you just pick up your phone and check another piece of technology? Yeah. How many of you have checked another piece of technology in this room since I started talking? I'm not selling you anything. Up to you, but you're killing your ability to learn. It's your decision. I don't mind what you do. But in, the, in this environment, even though I'm blinded by the light, um, it, there's more social pressure not to do that. But you feel a total permission to do that in the virtual world, don't you? It's actually an interesting piece of study, uh, research coming out. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a study of what's called attentional norms. It's being discovered now that if you're in a virtual meeting of greater than four people, you feel a complete permission to do whatever the hell you want. Play with a dog, make a cup of tea, talk to the UPS guy. Um, who's done that? You're in a room of 30, and you're like, it doesn't matter if I'm here or not. Um, but if you're in a room of four or fewer, you don't feel that. You feel actually required to focus. Now, why would that matter? If I, if I had to talk to eight people, I would do two calls of four because I'm going to have a much higher level of, of attention. So think about this. If your messaging is, is confusing already, we talked about that, and your customer is sort of self-distracting every once in a while, they're never going to get it. You get a nice glazed over smile and it, and it ends badly. The second challenge uh, with virtual communication is actually a loss of mental bandwidth. In a very real medical way, how many of you here are doctors in the room? Like a bunch of you, right? It's good if I have a heart attack, I'm well covered. Um, uh, you actually... Uh, experience uh, a, de a decline in cognitive ability when you spend too long in the virtual world. That's your chemical that builds up called glutamate. And it's kind of your body body's defense against overload. And because you have to focus so much more intensely in a virtual environment, who remembers the early days of COVID where you did six hours of Zoom calls? And how did you feel at the end of the day? Your brain was just Play-Doh. Now, you could do six hours of live meetings, you wouldn't feel as bad. What happens is this, this, this fatigue sets in really quickly. One of the rules of this, by the way, if you're going to do virtual selling, do it in the morning. Don't do afternoon meetings. Don't try and get a group of people at four o'clock in the afternoon over Zoom, especially if they're in a corporate where they're in Zoom all the time, because let somebody else try and fight that Zoom fatigue battle. And then the final one, um, the, the, none of these are more important, but this I find particularly interesting is... In a virtual environment, you get a loss of feedback or social cues. Do you remember what I said? Communication is a highly social process. Now, it's really weird. I don't love that I've got these spotlights on me. I wish I didn't. They don't really need it, actually. And I can't really see your faces. But that's important to me as a communicator. If some of you, one of you is sitting there going, this is a pile of crap. In a certain setting, I might be like, you look like you think this is a pile of crap. Tell me about that. Um, communication is a very dynamic process. By the way, I, I firmly believe that great sellers are not necessarily all good, great communicators. They're all good. They're not necessarily great, but they have very high social IQ. A good seller can read the room. So you just nodded your head. That says you sort of agree. And in some settings, I might say, oh, tell me about that. What are you thinking? You know, they're very, very good at reading and responding. But in a virtual room of 20 people, especially if people have their cameras off, you have no clue how they're responding. And if they've allowed themselves to get distracted and disconnected, you've completely lost them. So all of these forces, because we live here in the virtual world, amplify these mistakes. If we're confusing, it's a problem with distraction. If we're bloated with too much information, it's a real problem with mental bandwidth. And, and what happens if you're confusing and you can't spot that the customer is confused? So now the good news is the way you solve this um, is the same for either live or virtual. And that's what's kind of cool. The model I'm going to show you will work in both live and virtual settings, but it becomes particularly important in a virtual setting because of the sort of the narrowing of the window through which you've got to get your arrow. So, perfect. How do you solve it? 
So I want you to look on the, the, the bottom half of the page here. The way you solve this is, is, is two fundamental pillars. You've got to design outstanding messaging, and then you've got to deliver it so that what you plan to say is what actually comes out of your mouth. And if you want to think about the relative weight of those two things, it's about 70-30. If you want to be an ex exceptional communicator, 70% of it is message design, and 30% of it is message delivery, which, by the way, has nothing to do with eye contact or body language or power posing or jangling keys in your pockets. Everything you've ever been told about presentation skills is wrong and stupid. Uh, presentation delivery is about precision in language, so the thing you meant to say is what you actually did say. It has nothing to do with eye contact, but we'll, we'll talk about that maybe just for a moment. So the key thing is to get messaging right. Now, I do not have time to get into this now, but the underlying principle here is brain science. These seven hallmarks that are on your page that I'm going to explain to you um, are all to do with building brain-aligned communication. The brain wants and needs to consume information in a certain way. When we align with the way the brain works, we succeed. When we misalign with the way the brain works, we fail. And all of these hallmarks are underpinned by some important brain science, but that's just not what I have time to go through today. When you look at this, it doesn't fail because it's PowerPoint. It doesn't fail primarily because the presenter was, the builder was just so flat out lazy. It fails because traditional PowerPoint-based presentations almost perfectly violate how people learn. It's astonishing that the tool built for communication almost perfectly violates how communication should work. But it's cool for me because I have a job as a result. So, so what are the hallmarks? Now again, we can't get into the tools here, but you can literally take the bottom half of the page and say, does my messaging conform to these hallmarks? And you can do astonishing things, and we've seen clients do astonishing things just with this overview keynote. So this is what you want to take away and think about. So number one, hallmark number one, really crisp and clean and simple. Doesn't matter how much you want to say, you need to boil it so it will actually fit within a normal human brain. Um, how many of you are familiar with WebEx, the platform? Zoom, Teams, blah, blah, blah. This is the new messaging for WebEx that we built with Cisco. It used to be 100 mind-numbing slides. This is the new message, which, by the way, is tracking at a 75% conversion rate when compared with a 35% conversion rate before it was rebuilt. We'll talk about that a bit later. Any story, if you have the self-discipline and the tools to do it, can be told so it will fit within a normal human brain. It's just a matter of discipline. If you ever ask me, if people ever ask me, what do I think is the number one distinction between an average communicator and an exceptional communicator, I'll say this. The exceptional communicator understands what's primary, and they understand what's secondary, and they focus ruthlessly on what's primary. One of the things that's wrong with that deck is, I kid you not, 80% of what's in there or more just did not need to be there. Not for that sales conversation. An early sales conversation is about a problem and a high-level treatment of how you solve it. Nothing to do with how your solution works. Nothing to do with it. That comes later. But all of these decks are packed with features, functions, speeds, and speeds, whatever you want to call it, and they just clog up the machine. So what I want to show you here, what I want to recommend, this is the example in your handout. This is a very modern lighting solution. A company called Graybar, many of you will know, based in St. Louis, just up the road. Um, this is a message to, oddly, a hospital about retrofitting their lighting. This is the, the, the document that carries the one-hour conversation. This is the appendix. Everyone, when they build a, mess, a presentation, always builds one document. Never do that. Always build two. Build the primary document. The technical name for this is the crap that you might possibly need if Johnny Geek in the room says, well, do you have any other data on that? You're like, yeah, actually, look at page 23 here. I can show you that. But what you've now done is something genius as a communicator is you haven't allowed all this stuff to contaminate, distract from, and dilute the core message. And curiously, whenever we work with clients, the sellers are all convinced they're going to be in this every meeting. What percentage of meetings do you think this ever gets cracked open? 5%. So in other words, crisp, clean, and simple. If you need additional detail, have it in a secondary document. Then your conversation gets focused around what's truly primary. Second hallmark, deeply rooted in a customer problem. This one is so important. I wish I had more time to talk about it. Profoundly rooted in a customer problem. 
We have really ended up almost always defaulting to this bifold model. This entire page is about the problem. You want to do what's called a problem deconstruction. You want to take the core problem and break out all of its pain points. So what you will often do, and I think this is great practice, put the front cover, the question that de de uh, describes the problem you're going to solve. So if I'm talking, what's your name? Yeah, Callie. So I'm talking to Callie. She's the CIO of a large bank. If I come in and say, hey, Callie, WebEx 4.0, she's like, get out of my office. If I come in with this question, hey, Callie, with so many tools to communicate, why do your global team still feel so disconnected? Yeah, she's jumping out of her chair at that. It's a simple repositioning. In any sales conversation, fantastic working rule, one third of it should be about the problem. Don't just name the problem and jump into the solution. They have to feel the pain of it, lead and linger. We've actually done a little bit of messaging work with um, Health Rosetta, uh, who many of you will know. And this is the front cover. I love this. Uh, I don't love the graphic. It's too, too friendly and stock photo. Don't use stock photos for anything. Um, but, you know, I love this. It's so in your face. Why is your health plan designed to benefit everyone except you? and your employees, the people are actually paying for it. That's a very good provocative question. That's kind of a draft version of it, but that's the problem. You're buying a health plan, it benefits everyone except you, and you're the guys paying for it. So get that problem out, and then often in the inner uh, 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 page, take some time. Why? Because no one buys because your solution is good. They buy because they finally realize they have a problem that they must solve. And we, we always make this mistake. We go and we hammer them with how good our solution is, and the customer, in their back of their deep lizard brain, is like, why do I care? Great phrase. The job of a sales message is to destabilize the status quo. You only do that by showing them that, that the pain of the status quo exceeds the pain of making a change. This is especially true in your industry because everyone kind of knows that their health plan sucks, but nobody... Oddly, people aren't willing to move. Like, you know what? It sort of works. Yeah, it's crazy expensive, but you know, my guys get sick and they can go to the doctor. I got other th fish to fry. You've got to take that do nothing option off the table, and that's what happens when you focus on the problem. Third hallmark, number three there. You want to build a narrative based on a small number of big ideas. A small number of big ideas. See, ideas are the traffic of the mind. We do very badly cognitively with fact and data. We do really well with ideas. Um, if you left this meeting and someone said, what was that segment about? You're not going to play a recording of today because you don't have that in your brain. You're going to say, it's kind of interesting. He talked about retellability um, and, and that we need to, to focus harder on the second meeting. Like, That's exactly, your brain is doing what all brains do. They actually distill information to a small number of ideas. So what would great communicators do, as they always have done? feed the brain what it wants, which is a small number of ideas. So let's take this as an example. You set up the problem that if you get lighting wrong, it's really bad. Nursing productivity, patient satisfaction, legal risk, clinical outcomes. You get lighting wrong in a hospital, there's a lot goes wrong. So then the solution is offered. The first big idea is a modern LED solution with intelligent controls will totally solve this. Great, the problem can be solved by the solution. Would somebody buy? No. What if it's a billion dollars? So the second big idea is this is incredibly affordable. Cost has come down. LED never burns out, so maintenance and repairs go away. And by the way, the government will pay for you to have low, low voltage lighting. Wow, it works, and it's really cheap. Will they buy? No. What if I have to shut the hospital for a year? So the third insight in this particular story is deployment is incredibly non-disruptive. We can refit a room in the time when one of your elderly patients is going for lunch and then having physical therapy. Now will they buy? Yes. Insights or big ideas and sales messages, this is not directly in your handout, it's worth capturing, are beliefs. You've got to understand what someone needs to believe in order to take an action. Because in human beings, action is preceded by belief. So in that case, they need to believe it works, they need to believe they can afford it, and they need to believe it's non-disruptive. You've got to think holistically about what they need to believe. Otherwise, you'll just talk about your solution. And as I just showed you, that would not be enough. Fourth hallmark of a great message is these ideas, if you can, should be powerfully supported. I want you to imagine there was an idea 
that I was trying to get across to you, which is how tragic the loss of life was for Britain in World War I. So that's my idea. I'm trying to get that across to you. I could show it to you this way and say, well, we lost 888,246 uh, male deaths, as that was. Now, that is a technically accurate number. Does that grab you in any way? No. In fact, what does that even look like? Most messaging needs to have a degree of emotional engagement. People, in fact, do not make decisions in their rational left brain. Decisions are made in the emotional right brain. It's proven by people who have had any right brain injury, one of the things that you notice about them is they can't make decisions. Because decisions are synthetic. It's putting everything together. And, and it's, you can almost tell, when you make a big decision, like buying a house or a car or asking someone to marry you, do you ever notice that like, you feel the decision more than it's intellectual? Like, let's do it. That's very much a feeling. We know that this happens. So one of the things you want to be good at in your messaging is presenting a balance of left and right brain engagement. So imagine I had a, a, an idea like this. This would be the left brain treatment of that. There's nothing wrong with fact and data. But what if I showed it this way? This is actually a piece of art that was developed in London on the 100th anniversary of the outbreak of World War I. And the artist laid out 888,246 plastic poppies coming out of Windsor Castle. By the way, in a big room like this, there's often someone who saw this. Any of you see this? There's usually somebody who was like there or someone actually bought a poppy because you could do that afterwards. And the interesting story about this is, um, A, they were going to leave it there for just a few weeks. They had to leave it there for months because people were flocking to it. But more interestingly, people were completely overwhelmed emotionally. They were crying because they finally realized, oh, that's what 888,246 looks like. That's just an example of what right brain engagement, how it works. There are four or five tools. Storytelling is a tool. So tell a story about, you know, there was this guy and he got cancer and you tell the story and that draws people in. You can always use story essentially as an architectural framework for pieces of a presentation. Imagery is, is the other one. Just a good example. Some of you may even remember this. Um, any of you remember seeing this ad? Now, what's interesting is that many of you said, yes, this was well over 10 years ago. That's the power of an image. What's the idea here they're trying to get across? The tundra tows a lot. Now, how much does the space shuttle weigh? I don't know, but I'm pretty sure it's heavier than my bass boat. Like, so somebody would look at this. I know, it's a pretty big ass bass boats in the south. I have seen them. Um, I'm a fly fisherman, by the way. I'm a little allergic to that. But that is just a really excellent example of idea visualization. So what you want to do in your message, your sales message, is find a couple of moments where you find a powerful visual imagery, metaphor, or story that will really, really bring the idea to life. Because your goal is to create a balanced engagement of left and right brain. Now, those first three hallmarks are kind of the uh, four hallmarks, sorry, are the, most, are the most important. The last two, uh, uh, you think it's three, I'll get to why in a minute, are fairly straightforward. The fifth hallmark is logical sequence. Again, I wish I had a little bit more time here, but... But the brain absolutely needs story to really store any information. We do very badly with um, bulleted PowerPoint lists. I won't play any games with the other speakers. It would be unkind. But a, a game you can play is if a speaker does not have a clean narrative story, when a slide comes up, just ask yourself, what was on the previous slide? You're going to frighten yourself like, I have literally no idea. And he just talked about it for five minutes. When you have a logical narrative that's much less likely to happen, what's the good news? Different PS. In every sales message, there's a story handed to you. Just don't screw it up. Problem, solution, action. That's the logic of any narrative. You have a problem, Mr. Customer, Mr. Customer, it's kind of bigger and more serious than you think it is. All, all sales messages are a three-act symphony. Movement one, you've got a problem, it's bigger and more serious than you think it is. Movement two, we have an unreal good solution for this. The best solution that's out there, organized through a medium of a number of ideas. This is the WebEx message. So problem, bigger and more serious than you think it is. Value proposition, typically three to four big ideas, key beliefs. We know how to solve this better than anyone else. So how does it work? How do we move forward? Next steps. This is how it's going to work. That narrative dramatically increases comprehension and it dramatically increases retellability. Leading to the sixth hallmark is, make sure you have a specific action. It's nothing worse in sales than saying, well, that was, uh, 
a great meeting, let's keep talking. That's death in sales. What you want to say is, you know what, this seemed to go really well. I'd like to suggest we do this as the next step. Let's do a pilot. Give us some of your data. We'll do an analysis. We'll come back to you and let you know what you think. That um, lighting solution isn't trying to sell lighting. What they want is to be allowed to come into the hospital and do an analysis of your lighting. Once they've done that, 90% conversion rate. They're not trying to sell the lighting yet. It's a, a process, as you know. Now, I said there were seven hallmarks, and I've given you six. Those are the six hallmarks of a message. The seventh hallmark is absolutely critical. The seventh hallmark is not about the message, but the medium in which the message lives. This is the seventh hallmark. A document specifically designed for retellability. And the key part of that phrase is specifically designed for retellability. Follow me on a logic path here. When you present to somebody, particularly knowing that you need them to retell it, do you want them to learn something? Yes or no? Yes. Now, okay, so can you give them no document? No, because now you've got one of three choices. One is they have to rely on unaided recall. Well, good luck with that. Unaided recall of any information will never exceed 10%, and it's a random 10%. So you have no, no basis to believe that unaided recall of Jack is going to be able to retell the story. What's the second thing they might do? Take photos of your slides. Have you ever seen that? How many of you have taken a photo of a slide today? Isn't that funny? What were you telling the speaker? Give me a freaking handout. I'm not being rude here, but let's just call it what it is. Like, I mean, it's so obvious. Half of you have taken photos of a slide. That tells me you might actually like to have had that as a permanent record. This is not rocket science. So the second thing is photos. What's the problem with that? I need you to get the whole story, not pick two random slides out of it. That isn't the whole story. And the third one, of course, so that doesn't work. And the third one, of course, is you can ask them to make notes. That's absolutely exhausting. I hope you're finding today interesting. What if I didn't give you this handout, not this handout, the one you actually have, and you think you were scribbling notes? What would that be like? Totally exhausting. Have you ever been to a conference and you made a load of notes? Well, A, you're disconnected from the speaker, so you don't really get it. And then a month later, you look at your notes and like, was I on crack? What was I even thinking? You can't make sense of it. Your ability to make notes with the quality and precision of compared to my ability to bake them into a document, is, is there's no comparison. So none of the no document options work if you want people to learn. So you have to give them a document. So what can you give them? Can you give them a slide deck? No. They won't print it, and it doesn't work. PowerPoint's OK as a tool for delivering visuals, but it's not a tool for baking a document. So you end up, if you follow the logic, that you have to create a document specifically designed for retellability. Do you know what the most fun moment in sales is? It's at the end of the meeting when the customer says, can I have a few more of those? I get the odd email. Not that many. I get the odd email when someone says that happened. What's the only reason they want that? Because they want to retell the story. And if you're smart, you teach them that. At the very beginning of the meeting, what did I say? Oh, you've got a handout here. You'll find this useful. We're going to work through it, take notes. And then if you wanted to explain any of this to somebody later, you could. I'm actually subtly teaching you that this is the retellability document. Now, I wanted to spend most of our time today on that. That's what great messaging looks like. Seven hallmarks, six of the message, one of the document. And just from that alone, you could go do something pretty spectacular. If you, I'm not here to sell you training, but we have e-learning and live training. We're going to give a few e-learnings away, by the way. I'll tell you about that later. But, but if you wanted to go deeper on the tools, you could. But, but you can do enough, I think, with what I gave you here today. Now. Without going too quickly, look at the right-hand page. There are a couple of things, other things we need to talk about. Um, you do have to deliver that message effectively. And it has nothing to do with eye contact and body language. The top of the page there, the, the pinwheel, is essentially the key delivery skills that you want. Um, the first thing you want to be really, really good at is something nobody loves, but you have to, rehearsal. Don't think it's going to come out of your mouth right the first time. It's not. There's an infinite number of ways of saying anything. Grammar, syntax, vocabulary, sentence structure, dialect, whatever. What are the odds you're going to find the perfect way first time? You're not. It's just like golf. You're not going to hit a shot you haven't hit a thousand times on the practice range. You're never going to say it right if you haven't practiced it. The number one thing you've got to get right is based on, on, on this slide. Know the arc of the argument. What do I mean by the arc of the argument? What is the frame of the story? So at Graybar, here's the frame of the story. 
you get lighting wrong, and somebody timed me. You get lighting wrong, it's going to hurt nursing productivity, patient satisfaction, create legal risk, and harm clinical outcomes. An amazing, a modern lighting solution can completely solve this. The economics are fabulous, and it's non-disruptive. And so the way we move forward is we come and look at your hospital and do an analysis. How long did that take? 15, 20 seconds? That's my value prop. And the reason you have to do that is sales has changed. You don't always get an hour. You might only get five minutes. You might get, hey, quickly, what's your pitch? That was a very robust pitch in 15 seconds. It's your inner compass. If I know that, I can tell the story in one minute. I can tell it in five minutes. I can tell it in 20 minutes. I can tell it in an hour. But if you don't know the arc of the story, you're completely lost. The way you know you know your story is you can do what I just did. I can literally say, Here's the problem, here are my three big ideas, here's the action I'm gonna ask for. Do it on a cocktail napkin. The number one thing you wanna get right is knowing the arc of your story, then you can be infinitely flexible in the customer meeting, because no customer meeting ever goes as planned. The other two sets of skills I don't wanna talk about, the top of the pinwheel talks about good communication mechanics, the bottom part of the pinwheel talks about certain things you can do in terms of style and persona to build trust. Interestingly enough, there are some things speakers do unintentionally that really destroys trust. You want to take a shower after you've met them, and you're like, I really hate that person. And there's other people who are like, you know, I really kind of like them. I sort of trust them. And those are actually variables we can understand. So you generally, as a rule, want to speak in a way that builds trust rather than creates hatred, right? Would that tend to make sense? Um, we can't get into that now, but there's the, the story of presentation delivery is so much more interesting than eye contact and body language. So let me finish with a simple question. This looks great, right? I mean, everyone knows PowerPoint sucks, and sort of this is pretty, right? This is nice, surely. Um, does it actually work? Well, look on the page there. The great thing about sales is everything is measurable. I told you this is actually that unnamed example on your page that is tracking about a 72% conversion rate. This is C-level messaging at a bank. That's hard. It went from about 35 to 72 or 3 at last count. The gray bar message is listed on your page. It went from 13 to 35% sales conversion rate. That's an astonishing number. What would you do to increase your conversion rate by 10 points, let alone two and a half times? The other thing we saw at Graybar is the sales cycle time almost halved. That's the number one driver of productivity when you're selling, is how long the sales uh, pursuit takes until you get a deal. Why would it move faster? Because it's more compelling and it's more retellable. So you don't have to keep coming back like Sisyphus just pushing the rock uphill forever. You get one call closes. I sell a fairly complex solution, but it's not uncommon to get a one call close. I have a conversation with a client, and they're ready to move after one call. Why? Because I think we know how to tell our, our story fairly well. So we know it works empirically. For the, the geeks and nerds in the room and doctors, does it work scientifically? Actually, before I talk about it, I just want to show you this. One thing you're going to notice is your customers love it. Anyone kind of wake up in the morning like, I hope someone inflicts a monster PowerPoint on me today? I don't think so. This is an interesting story. This is a buyer for a major retailer in the US. And uh, uh, one of our clients was a seller selling to him. And in fact, that document in his hand is the document that this guy had produced. And what's really funny is, in the middle of the meeting, this guy stops the meeting and he says, can, can I just thank you? <laughs> Customers don't normally say that. And, and this guy's like, uh, what now? Why? He says, can you guys thank you for talking to me like an adult? He says, you wouldn't believe the crap I have to put up with. It's a true story. He goes off to a filing cabinet. He gets this monster stack of slide decks which in his hand. And he's like, this is what I have to put up with. I hate this stuff. These are companies like General Foods, Pepsi, Free Child. I mean, these are great companies, but they don't communicate well. And these people hate it. So it isn't just that your story is more compelling. It actually differentiates you. People actually like that. By the way, this company that does this, and by the way, these are not particularly professionally produced, and they don't need to be. We actually have a little bit of evidence that says, if it looks a little hand-drawn, quote-unquote, customers actually think it's more authentic than if it's especially glossy, produced by marketing. Um, this company has won Vendor of the Year twice from Walmart and twice from Target, and they're largely held up because of the quality of their communication. So customers are not... The customers are eager for you to do this, to get it right. It will have that payoff. The second thing, then, as we saw, is that empirically you can show it works from the results. 
but we can also show it scientifically, which is fun. We have a client, and they said, we actually want to see if this does work on the brain in a different way, in the way you said it did. So um, we actually, well, they hooked us up with a cognitive neuroscientist out of Stanford, and we did this really crazy experiment. We got all these different people, we strapped them into all kinds of brain scanners, and they, almost all of them survived unharmed, which was great. And then we broke them into groups, and we had, uh, it was four groups in total. Two were presented to a very traditional way, with a PowerPoint slide deck, and we didn't like deliberately try and bias the, 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 the experiment. We had these presented by the top sellers at this company, very well presented. And then two groups were presented to using our model where the message had been redesigned. Uh, the, the, the results are absolutely fascinating. I'm just gonna show you uh, uh, two slides that are on your page there. This is eye tracking and attention software and this is what was happening in the customer, where, where and how they were focusing as these slides were being presented. Now, if you look behind the dots, you can see a circle. I mean, it's really pretty, but that's just a bulleted slide. It's a bulleted list. You can do it, you can put it in a circle, but it's still a bulleted list, right? It's just lipstick on a pig. And, and you can animate it, have the bullets whiz in. It's just lipstick and eyeshadow on the same pig. That isn't creating a narrative, it's just creating a little bit of visual image, uh, interest. What do you see? They didn't know where to look. There's no story, there's no flow, there's no big idea to ground them or for them to focus on. So they're dotting around desperately trying to find somewhere to look. And the darker the shade, the higher the focus. Look in the upper left. That's where the focus went. Problem is, what was behind the red dot? Nothing. That's what happens when you're presented with a bulleted slide and you scan it. By the way, how many of you look at a slide? You've scanned all 10 bullets before the speaker's halfway through the first one. So now like, great, I get two minutes off you know, till we get to the next slide, and the dance just begins again. And you see it so perfectly here. That's what happens with poorly structured narratives. What happens when you get it right, same technology with, um, it actually wasn't Cisco, but it was a, very, a model very, very similar to this. Um, look at the eye tracking for this treatment. And again, you see two really fascinating things. The first thing, I wish you could see this as a time lapse. The customer initially scans the whole thing, but then they just track with the presenter. Their eyes paint it, which means they're learning it, following it, and they're learning it. And then the second thing, if any of you had any degree of nervousness about leading with a problem and camping out on the problem, look at the red dot there. That was the deepest piece of their problem treatment. This essentially says if you continue to make this mistake with your technology, you are going to have a massive security risk when you go to the cloud. Look at the engagement that that got. The general point I make is if you get that level of engagement around the problem, you're 80% of the way home. If you can simply seal the deal by showing you can solve it, then you're going to win. So, um, uh, final thing is at the end of this crazy science experiment, we administered a kindergarten level test of comprehension. It was ridiculously simple. And what's super interesting is um, the, the, you have one of these bars on your chart page. I want to give you both. The group that was presented to traditionally made on aggregate 10 mistakes, which is absurd. They shouldn't have made any mistakes, but it's because they were disconnected. The group presented to this way made in aggregate only one mistake, which means they'd learned it. And by the way, the other part of this slide that's interesting is we asked the participants for credit. There was actually sort of a leadership academy they were in. For credit, would you be willing to come back and represent this in a week? And only 20%, even though there was a reward for them doing it, only 20%, 18% said they would be willing to, but 80% said they would because when they had been presented to in the proper way. So I hope that was helpful. What have I said today? What I've said is that messaging is unbelievably important. It's really hard to get right, and it gets harder in a virtual environment. There's a typical set of mistakes that we repeatedly make. Can this be solved? Absolutely. Build messaging that is brain aligned, that conforms fundamentally to those seven hallmarks, six of the message in the handout, uh, the, the leave behind document. And then you also got to make sure you have precision and a certain, an appropriate style and persona in your delivery. If you do that and get it right, it's very, very good reasons to believe that you'll see a substantial increase in sales outcomes. Um, I thought just for fun, we have this really, really cool e-learning. Uh, it's it's a, a skills of message design and message delivery. And I'm just going to throw two of those for free. And I think Lin Ann has some way of organizing a prize. If any of you wants that, it's like a $500 thing. So a couple of you will get that for free. Um, I'm at time now. I'm around all day. Uh, and we'll be here for cocktails to see if anyone has any questions. But I don't want to derail your time. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you.